It's been like a week since the world bowed down to its new Brazilian overlords, and it is a great thing to see happen. Another region finally gets to join North America and Europe atop the siege landscape, and it was about damn time. Who better to carry the torch for Brazil than ninjas in pajamas? Second place last year, first place this year, and already putting themselves in contention for one of the greatest teams of all time. I will take full credit for this curse. I said they were going to lose 2-0 to Dark Zero, and then aggressively tweeted about Liquid all through the Grand Finals, but <laughs> I digress. NIP got what they deserve. It doesn't feel like a week since SI ended, but if I took any longer to get this video out, it would definitely be too late. Like, you have no idea how much waking up at 3 a.m. and having to watch all of the games and then constantly crashing throughout the day was wrecking havoc on me physically. The post show was hella worth it though, so I hope you guys enjoyed it if you saw any of it. We haven't done a LAN review in a really long time, so I'll do a brief excerpt for all teams and how they did, and then we can talk about the event as a whole. I won't do any like personal rankings because I don't think they would have really differed from where teams placed anyway. So sit back, prepare your disagreements in the comments, and let's talk one last time about SI 2021. Starting from the bottom with the group stage eliminations, two APAC teams in Giants Gaming and Cyclops Athlete Gaming. Cyclops was the team I predicted would go out in group A, but I hate being right because they were so excruciatingly close to proving me wrong. This is a team that seems very set in their ways and didn't adapt well to other teams' playstyles on the fly. They would bring weird operator setups for similar takes over and over again sometimes and generally seemed unwilling to deviate from that strategy. However, on the last day, they took both Empire and BDS to Cafe and lost on just the last round every time. If they had won either of those games, they would have been safe from elimination. They almost did against the two best teams in their group. The underdogs nearly saved themselves and they had a lot of people cheering them on to see if they could survive. And even though they didn't, the fact that they got that close against the two best teams in Europe alone is a nice accomplishment. Hopefully this is something they can use as fuel for stage two of APAC North. And Giants Gaming, or as of the recording of this video, X Giants, I'll explain later. They were also waiting until the last day of groups to see if they would be knocked out. They were, but the highlight for them was defeating both Makers and TSM back to back on day two of Group B. That TSM game especially is a really interesting one to watch if you have a mind to go back and watch any of the VODs. The North American playstyle for CAFE does involve surrendering a lot of top floor map control at some point because then it means you can get all of your roamers back to sight. Giants kept players upstairs for a really long time and dismantled TSM's attacking game plan. It was really well done, but that was like the sole thing that they could do well the entirety of the tournament. They couldn't escape last place because of their tiebreaker game against SSG. It's back-to-back -back SIs for this team without a lot of success, so I wish I could tell you what's next for them. They don't even have an org anymore, which just feels like, at this point, they're getting punched in the teeth. These boys are down pretty bad. Moving into the playoff eliminations, we'll start with the third and final APAC team, Cloud9. And the whole region was down bad, it turns out. If you could put a tagline under this team, it would be C9, Wasted Potential. They were so good on entry kills, man. Like, they got those opening picks and then they simply could not translate that into a round win. And when I say good, they had three players in the top 15 of the entire tournament with the best entry ratios, and the only other team to have that many players within the top 15 was NIP. Their early rounds were stellar, and then the longer rounds went on for, they seemed more and more lost, and that was consistent. It's like you'd get your hopes up they could bring a round back with that entry pick, and then the rest of this round turns into a nail biter that ultimately ends in disappointment. Please fix this, boys. The first EU team to go out was G2. And at that moment, a million European fans cried. Oh, Penu, why did you abandon us? I don't know if that was good, but we're just going to roll with it. To put it bluntly, G2 looked like they were playing at a funeral that occasionally had a masseuse. They were so focused and hard on themselves at all times, it felt like they were worried about failing their SATs midway through taking the test. For a brief few hours, they were one of those teams that was also in consideration to get knocked out of Group A, and then they weren't, and then they lost their first playoff game 2-0 to a group of Canadian rookies who didn't even make CL playoffs this stage. What? I don't care if your team is still shifting around after Pengu's retirement. This is embarrassing for you, no matter who you are. The writing might be on the wall for a couple of these guys, so they better show up on stage two if they want to see any success with this current lineup. Part of me that really was like hating on G2 at the beginning of 2020 somehow just resurfaced with this part of the script. I don't know what happened, but we're here now. That's a joke. I didn't hate G2. Dark Zero also... <laughs> 
Okay, man. This is gonna be the last time I put stock into Dark Zero for a long time. Their group stage was okay, even if they went one and three against Brazilian teams. And then they play the only Brazilian team that they beat in groups when they make playoffs and... No. Dark Zero just looked like they weren't playing with a lot of heart. Yeah, I mean, they weren't winning very often, so there was, like, not a lot of hype to build up there, but that whole bench looked really dead whenever cameras cut back to them. They also seemed like they were experimenting with role changes mid-tournament. Like, I feel like we saw Skies on support operators more than we probably should. NJR wasn't making the impact that his entry stats suggests he was trying to make, and Mint just couldn't keep up. Obviously, two of those guys would retire once the team got back from Paris, but SI was proof that they have some serious rebuilding to do regardless. Thank God for Zach finally giving us an update from the void about how they're doing. That video is worth a watch, by the way. And also, I definitely don't agree with CGG ranking them number nine in the world after SI. Even before those two retirements, that number is still way too high. Space Station was also knocked out in the same round, and I hate to say it, I think that is definitely Canadian's last ride. Done and dusted. For what it's worth, I think this is probably the highest that they could have expected to go, because even though Troy is coming back, he was just there as a sub for Luke, and Fultz had done stage one IGL work already, so I doubt that they would have put him back in that role if he was only there temporarily. Even if the team showed flashes of old SSG from time to time, it just wasn't the old SSG. They won three maps out of the ten that they played. It was just... It's just weird to watch. Like, not just because you knew going into this that this was Canadian's last tournament, but you just knew that these were legends at this time last year, and they were trying to play as though they were the same team, but you're sitting here watching them knowing that they just aren't the same. Troy, from me to you, enjoy retirement, my dude. Can't thank you enough for everything that you've done for Siege. I, I also still owe you that drink. Above them were the next round of eliminations, beginning with Makers. Thank God! It makes me uncomfortable when a team springs out of nowhere and starts challenging some of the best teams in the world. Like, it happened with Forrest back at the Raleigh Major when they went all the way to the semifinals, and it almost happened here because they beat TSM in the group stage. Luckily, TSM still beat them in the playoffs, but the reason I don't like it is because it's an anomaly that you can't prepare for, and they purposefully made it hard for themselves to be prepped against. They weren't banning operators during PG Nationals, they aren't even in EU Challenger League, but they still made SI, and they're wasn't a lot of tape on them. Overall, they looked all right here. I, I, I want them to clean house in European Challenger League and then make the EUL so we can really see more of what they're made of, but hats off to the Italians for getting this far. Like, seriously, that is still pretty impressive. Same with Parabellum. The NA team who didn't have to defeat that many prominent opponents to qualify did just as well as Makers, but under a couple different caveats. They got a spot in North American Challenger League after Altiora was incapable of getting them a house in Las Vegas, but they swapped two new players out to begin that CL campaign. Then their coach gets terminated and one of their players gets banned, so they get permission to bring their entire old lineup back, waltz into France, beat NIP and SSG in groups, and then eliminate G2 in the playoffs. This was not supposed to happen. They looked really well put together, had a lot of energy, were matching Brazilian aggression with some of their own, and they didn't let pressure against big names really get to them all that much. I just wish they'd been able to make Challenger League playoffs, but they had bigger fish to fry. Like winning 75 grand. I'm just, I'm just so proud of these guys, dude. Please don't disband. You'll notice, by the way, that up until this point, not a single Latin American team had been eliminated yet. Well, two of them did here. Furia had a good start to their group stage, then tapered off a lot as the tournament progressed and couldn't stand up against BDS in their final match of the playoffs. Even though they seemingly weren't doing too hot, their bench had a lot of smiles and hype. Their mental was really high and just seemed like they shook losses off really well and moved right on to the next thing. For a team that made two roster swaps and then surprised a lot of people by managing to get top four in stage one of BR6 and then get ninth through 12th at SI? Good. It's a much stronger position than almost getting relegated like six months ago, so they're just showing a lot of very good, consistent progression. I still don't think I'd put them, like, normally top four in Brazil because of this result, but hey, stage two and three will tell a different story. The other Latsam team to go out at this stage was Team One, who probably bucked the Brazil plays aggro all the time stereotype the most. They played more methodical, sometimes slower siege, but then could explode like at any moment. Like their game against G2 in groups is a really good one to watch if you want to go back. Alamau was stealing the spotlight in a lot of occasions, and I think there was even conversation about what if another team signs him internationally? I, I don't think it's going to happen, but that just goes to show you how impressed Western audiences were 
by this guy who they probably hadn't seen if they didn't watch BR6 before now. And all of this is especially impressive considering they were sixth in BR6 last stage with a team that looked like it was scraped together from what FaZe, Black Dragons, and INTZ didn't want. I didn't watch a lot of Team 1 overall, but this just seems like a sign that the team that they've assembled is already on the right track. Now, we enter the top eight, which is where both of Europe's last hopes died simultaneously. Empire. Wow. Wow. I don't think there's a bigger example of how quickly your light can get snuffed out than these guys. A nearly undefeated group stage, surprising a lot of people, and seeing Joystick come back to form with the most kills and the group stage MVP award, and then the playoffs happened. I was hesitant to say that the reason they were doing so well in groups was because they were back in a LAN environment as opposed to online, and Joystick was coming back and they just basically told them to go kill. Like, I don't want to assume that they were that one-dimensional of a squad. But lo and behold, he got shut down completely in the two series that they lost in the playoffs, and the rest of Empire simply couldn't keep that momentum going. And when I say shut down, how about a .66 against Liquid in their last game when he was trying to play entry? Like, he might as well not have even been there. There were a lot of people who were hoping that like the old empire was back, but no, no, nope. They really weren't. You know it's bad when Joystick doesn't even get EVP honors for Siege GG after the event was over. You flash in the pan group stage and then literally nothing else substantial after that. I know that they managed to beat Team 1 without dropping more than three rounds, but it's the other two losses that I'm more concerned about. Get off the empire train, boys. Stage 2 better show more progress. BDS also went out way earlier than I thought. Uh, earlier than Ubisoft thought too. The Grand Finals hype video had BDS versus Dark Zero in the finals. <laughs> Talk about not following the script. Group stage, they were nearly flawless. They would have been undefeated if it wasn't for Empire beating them on overtime match point. So they get to playoffs, they're in the upper bracket, they've got momentum, and then they fall to the lower bracket because of NIP, then they beat Furia, and then they lose to TSM. I mean, I got the grand final game I was hoping for, but it went the opposite way. I really liked the idea or the story of BDS winning SI on home soil. Like the only time invite is ever gonna be held in France and they ruined it. Like Alems was having the tournament of his life. Bride had more plants than some people had kills, Ysera. And it looks like this well-oiled machine was just running at full speed. They either won by domination or kept their series close by winning a map every time. Perhaps the only weird thing about this was that it kind of seemed like it was an off tournament for Shiko. Like a lot of games and groups, he was getting out fried by teammates and couldn't even go positive on entry when it was all said and done. But I guess that's just a testament to how well the rest of his team is if their superstar fragger is having a rough go of it. They still managed to push all the way into top eight. They looked really good. I'm not concerned for BDS. Even if they didn't take it against my own heart, they're still the best team in Europe. Now we get to the top six. I'm sorry if this video is hella long, by the way, but there's just a lot of stuff to get through. FaZe Clan. It took until the top six for another Brazilian team to bite the dust, and I'm sad that it was these guys, because it was a solid outing. Bottom seed in Group A with a somewhat shaky start, a very close game against TSM in the upper bracket, and then met two of their BR6 compatriots back-to-back -back and just couldn't survive. They did lose to who would go on to be first and second place in the whole tournament, so I guess it's not a total loss? There wasn't really like one superstar player that broke out and aided them stats-wise. Everyone was kind of pretty tightly packed together, but I will say Bullet? on entry was less than ideal. He had a 50% opening dual win rate, he had the lowest rating on FaZe, and he's their Ash Yeager player. Like, props to FaZe for making it this deep with that kind of struggle, and we'll see if he can't bounce back later. And out at the same time as FaZe is Oxygen Esports. Who had, like, the exact same path as FaZe, by the way? Like, fourth in their group, won their first upper bracket game, and then lost their next two and were eliminated. And it came down to an NA versus NA brawl at the end that just tore my heart apart. I thought they were in such deep trouble, dude. Like, holy shit. That, that three-game loss streak that they had in groups made me think that there was no hope for them at all. But then they pull it back with a three-game win streak to get into fourth place, and then pulled a miracle out of their ass and knocked Empire out of the upper bracket. Like, what? Even though they lost their next two, I'm still super happy to see how well Yaga and Kino did in their first international environment. Yes, this image of Kino sitting by himself after that loss makes me impossibly sad, but they still did great. And I wasn't certain if they could keep their momentum up from winning stage one of the NAL. This was probably the best result they could have hoped for, given the other teams that we still have yet to talk about. Fourth place. The last bastion for North America, 
the US, Canada, Mexico handshake emoji that is TSM. Them being fourth really is kind of just a testament to how good Brazil was this year. They are bar none the best team in the world outside of Latin America. They got a lot of quality wins against NIP, MIBR, and OXG in groups, and also knocked BDS out of the playoffs before dying off in the last moment to Team Liquid on their way to the grand final. Again, that's just a Brazil 2021 thing. For his own part, Bolo was one of only three players alongside Paulu and Nesk who cracked into 200 kills for the whole tournament, and everyone else on that team was just playing into their roles so efficiently. They just ran out of gas against Liquid on the final map, and the only reason they were in the lower bracket was because of an overtime match point loss to FaZe Clan in the first game of the uppers. I just want them to replicate this kind of play in the North American League, dude. Like, they got fifth last stage, and now we have majors coming back? Fifth place ain't gonna cut it, dude. Third place, MIBR. Wow. <laughs> These guys were team one before the roster shuffle for this year, and they had some great results. But third place in the world? I'm, I'm very impressed. Every player on this team is like 22 or younger, and they're riding a lot of momentum. Second place at the November Major, second at Copa Elite Six, and now third at the World Championship. They tied TSM's record in groups, beat Liquid and OXG in that order to make it to the upper finals, then, just like FaZe, also fell to the eventual two grand finalists. Nothing to be ashamed about in this run at all. I can't say there was really one player who stood above the rest, because it seemed like everyone on that team was like winning MVP honors for every one of their matches, which just kind of speaks to the cohesion and the confidence in their strategy that these guys have. They look very well put together. It's like, it's, it's insane. I think we will see them win a major or two sooner rather than later. Second place. The team I jinxed. It's just proof the curse is still working. I apologize if this gets heavy, but for context, Paulu's father passed away while they were in the midst of their lower bracket run. He was, at the very least, able to call his father uh, while he was in the hospital, but he wasn't able to see him again when he finally did get the news of it happening. And when he did, he stuck 5,800 miles away from home. Can't go back and just has to live with it. This is after his mother passed away from cancer last year, as well. I'm reminded of a speech from Michal Blicharz, I'm sorry if I'm butchering his name, but he gave a speech at IEM Katowice 2019 when a similar thing happened to some CS players who were competing under similar circumstances. One player lost his father. One player lost his mother. But they chose to be here. Because in order to be the best, they had to be here this week. Not next week, not the week after that. They have to be here this week in order to be the best. They chose to stay because together with other people, they were chasing the same dream. And they chose not to fail those people. Now, I don't know, I have no idea what it takes to do what they did. I can't possibly imagine. But I wanted to take this opportunity while I'm here on stage to honor their sacrifice. Because what they did is what champions do. Until the point in the tournament where Paula realized his father was gone, Liquid were already looking like one of the best teams there. Third place in their group, a slight stumble in the upper bracket, but they were making the lower bracket run of a lifetime. Milos kept referencing Liquid's run at the International back in 2017 for Dota as a hopeful example of the same. And Paula, along with Nesk, suddenly showed up as the best fragging duo in the world, with both of them cracking above 200 kills, just above where Bolo sits. The two of them were showing everyone across the globe what they were missing by not watching BR6. Then Paulo gets the news. Somehow, he doesn't crack. He doesn't falter. He puts his head down, summons some superhuman strength, and keeps on playing at the exact same level that he did before. I, I, I don't even understand how that's possible. But he pushed through the pain, with the support of his team from all sides, out of game and in game, and was the best rated player of the entire tournament, with the second most kills, and was this close to finally getting a world championship. That is the story of Liquid from this event. Triumph, even in the face of tragedy, even if it wasn't exactly what they were looking for. Take nothing away from this team, aside from their final map performance in the Grand Finals. Like, uh, at that point, even I didn't really know what they were doing, but I can't describe the amount of respect that I have for Palu for pushing through that, 
for what he said was the worst day of his life. Probably gonna buy a jersey with his name on the back of it and frame it because that is unbelievable. But it still wasn't enough to beat the champs. If you had told me that these guys would go on a miracle run through the lower bracket of SI 2020 and would end up winning SI 2021, I would have said that their 2020 run was a fluke and they couldn't keep it going. But this was a storybook ending for NIP. A long-standing core of hungry Brazilian talent falling just short of upsetting Space Station at SI last year, then seeing the world get sidelined by COVID, still competing at a top four level online in Brazil through 2020, and decimating the field in the upper bracket of this year to finally call themselves the best team in the world. For some of these guys, it has been a really long time coming. Given that Siege hasn't been in eSport for very long, I think you can comfortably put this team in the conversation for top five all time, maybe even top three, depending on who you're talking to. If there was anyone who was gonna carry the flag for Brazil as they finally get a world champion, it might as well be these guys. Like, why not? I didn't have a lot of faith in their attacks. Like, I admitted as much. Through the group stage, I had reason to believe they would be knocked out early. They turned it around. It also probably helped that they were fighting mostly Brazilian teams through their playoff run, so they were working within a very comfortable play style. Like, the only non-Brazilian team they faced in the playoffs was BDS, and they still won. But the emotion, the passion, everything that this team produced was world championship level stuff. They overcame the odds and made it work on the second try. I have nothing else left to say. Congratulations to the 2021 Six Invitational World Champions Ninjas in pajamas. Sorry the video is so long. <laughs> Other than how the teams did, I think this event was exactly what the Siege scene needed to bounce back after COVID sidelined everything. The venue was glorious. The competition was both kind of where we left off from last year, mixed in with teams trying to readjust to not only playing regional opponents anymore. The production only had a few hiccups, which is normal for any LAN event. It was so good to see that many broadcast talent working at an event again. Congratulations to Ace and Desichu for working a blistering grand final, by the way. And this, it just feels like what we needed, man. Orgs, teams, fans alike, we really needed this. Hats off to Ubisoft for managing to do this with no COVID cases so far, though maybe we'll give it another week to see if anything ends up coming back positive, but they did it without any serious risk of the pandemic and at this high quality. The only things that I have criticism on, the sixth pick bug that caused so many rehosts needs to get looked at, the match replays are essentially useless because of the differences between the live build and the online build and the game simply crashes too much to make them worth it. The stories that I saw about player food were both concerning and hilarious at the same time. There were some people who I thought were snubbed from the broadcast talent roster, and no, I'm not referring to myself. And at the very least, Liquid having to play two series on the same day, one of them being a grand final with a map disadvantage, seems like it's something that desperately needs to get looked at for future tournaments. But I think, I think that's all I have to say. This was the longest video script I've ever written. So I think, um, I think I'm just gonna, uh, I think I'm, I'm just gonna stop. Yeah, I think I'm done. The stage two shuffle is already madly underway, so we will get to the recaps of all that insanity later this week. And I am currently really close to finally hitting Twitch partner requirements. So if you want to join in on the streams this week, you can help ensure that I don't get another rejected application this time around. Thank you as well for tuning into the post show that Jesse and I did for SI. It was a blast. And if you have any feedback on it, please let me know for next time. And yeah, thank you very much. I'll see you later. Peace.